Good afternoon, everybody. Happy One Health Week. I hope you've been enjoying all the activities. I hope you managed to get to the milkshake truck before it ran out. I just barely made it about 10 people after me. That was it. So I'm, I'm darn glad I made it. We're going to get started here in just a second. I'm giving people a chance to come into the room. All right, I'm going to get started here. So, well, I think probably everybody knows me, but I'm Reg Hoyt. I am the co-chair of Animal Biotechnology and Conservation, and I'm fortunate to be the chair of the DelVal One Health Working Group. For those of you who have ever attended a One Health seminar and who have been around campus at all, I hope that you understand what One Health is. And I think it's pretty simple. Uh, down at the bottom here, it says that it's a One Health is a transdisciplinary systems approach. Well, I think I can make it a little bit simpler than that. We only have one planet, and we're all in this together, whether we're talking about the environment, whether we're talking about animals, or whether we're talking about people. And because of that, we've all got one future together. Uh, it is our hope that every single student at Delville gets exposed to the concept of One Health and thinks of it probably more broadly than what we see in most instances beyond just the health of animals or the health of humans, but the well-being of the entire planet uh, and understanding that actually talking to other people from different disciplines uh, is going to make you better at what you do. Uh, and to exchange ideas and to think about things more holistically, whether that's dealing with a problem you have at the particular place where you work or your community or the region or entirely globally, uh, I really do feel that this is a concept that we can all embrace uh, and that it will all, all make all of us a little bit better. Here at Del Val, we approach it from a few ways uh, with education. Uh, all students are introduced to One Health uh, within their first year experience. Uh, and then every semester we have six seminars that are made available. So there's an ongoing opportunity to hear from people from very different disciplines from maybe what your major is. Uh, and through the courses in your program, hopefully you're hearing the application of One Health to the problems that you're studying. Research is another component. Uh, being able to reach across departments. Uh, DelVal is very small. Uh, there are really no silos here and neither should there be. And the ability to be able to talk and, and interact with each other is extremely important. And then this seminar is one of those elements of outreach. Um, trying to get the word out. This week has been all about outreach. We've had a pile of activities. Uh, if you haven't already made your One Health pledge, uh, well, we're here all week. Uh, and so folks will be in the Levin Dining Hall tomorrow again, and uh, make sure that you make your pledge, pick up your One Health sticker. It's a perfect thing to put on your laptop, your backpack, whatever. Um, and, you know, this is an opportunity to bring in our community as well. We have a wildlife trade exhibit, and I think our speaker today is perfect for, for opening that wildlife trade exhibit in Feldman. And that is open from 9 until 4 today and 9 to 4 tomorrow as well. So if you want to learn more about some of the things that uh, we've done in the past, all of the seminars that we have recorded in the past are at delval.edu slash One Health. And another item, which I promised from this week's uh, public service announcement competition for One Health Week, we have a winner. Uh, in fact, we actually have three excellent entries that were rated first, second, and third, but we had many inner, uh, inner entries from that. Uh, I think that this is a really good one here too. So I'm gonna start this 
and then we'll introduce our guests this evening or afternoon. Excellent. Thank you, Robin. I'm going to end this. So, EJ, you may start bringing up yours while I, I do an introduction here. I am extremely happy to have our speaker here today. Um, my past work certainly has mirrored some of the work that she'll be talking about today. And uh, we are so lucky. Uh, I was so happy when I wrote to EJ and asked her if she'd be willing to do a presentation for us. And she almost immediately said yes. So wait till you hear about our speaker. So EJ is Tasso Leventon's Professor of Biodiversity at the University of Oxford. Her PhD was on the wildlife trade with a focus on ivory, rhino horn, and Sega antelopes. Her research group, the Interdisciplinary Center for Conservation Science works on a wide range of projects understanding, predicting, and influencing human behavior in designing, monitoring, and evaluating conservation interventions in order to improve the effectiveness. She also runs a large program tackling the illegal trade in wildlife. She aims to ensure that all the research in her group is addressing issues identified by practitioners is carried out collaboratively with end users and builds the capacity of young conservationists, particularly in developing countries. She is a founder and chair of the Sega Conservation Alliance, one of my favorite species, and has launched a number of initiatives which aim to change the real world conservation uh, conversation around conservation, including the mitigation and conservation hierarchy approach to meeting a global vision of restoring nature in the conservation optimism movement. I could really use the conservation optimism movement. <laughs> she is the chair of the UK government's Darwin Expert Committee and a trustee of WWF UK. With that, it is all yours, EJ. And we will have uh, questions that you can put in the chat below. Right now, EJ, I'm, I'm seeing your full set of slides. Uh, not mm -hmm. just your current one. That's interesting, isn't it? What happens if I use slideshow? How about that? Is that better? That's it. That's perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Um, well, thank you, Reg. It's uh, really great to be here. It's uh, lovely to have this opportunity to talk to you all. And I'm really hoping that we'll have a really good uh, Q&A session. So... Um, I'm going to cast you back to the the bad days of two or three years ago when COVID-19 was raging and talk a little bit about um, some of the things that happened then in terms of the way we thought about the wildlife trade and then try and put it into broader context. And I'm going to very bravely start by um, stopping my share and then sharing another screen, which uh, will give a very small, short video. And... Um, hopefully there'll be sound. We've just tested it and there was sound. Um, and if there isn't, then somebody needs to tell me as soon as they can. Okay, so this is um, a video that was put out by an organization or a kind of, it's, it's a set of NGOs who got together uh, early, early on in COVID and produce something called Extinction Ends Here. And they did a rather nice video um, which captured the moment. So um, hopefully, shout if you can't see it. Dear humankind, thank you for being a super host. I'm hearing I it. I imagined I'd have the opportunity to jump to a species as abundant as you. Most viruses only get to know their original host animal. 
Many exist entirely in the humid understory of a remote rainforest. We viruses are kept in check by healthy environments with diverse and abundant wildlife. But when you rip forests apart and capture billions of animals to feed your insatiable appetite for flesh and false cures, you bring viruses like me out of our natural quarantines. You introduce us to new hosts like you. A super host of 8 billion individuals and counting. A walking, flying, swimming, human meat market. You make up a third of all mammals on Earth by weight. The animals you grow to feed yourselves outweigh all the wild mammals and birds on the planet. As you drive our natural wildlife hosts to extinction, you throw us life rafts bigger than the Titanic. Why wouldn't I jump? As sinister as I may seem, it is not in my interest to wipe out my hosts. We all need other life to thrive. So if this sickness in your bodies opens your eyes to the deeper sickness in our shared planet, it will be to all our benefit. But my big question to you is this, am I enough? If apocalyptic fires aren't enough, if vanishing glaciers aren't enough, if super hurricanes aren't enough, is the cold shadow I cast across the lives of you and your loved ones enough for you to finally confront the prospect of your own extinction? Only you, humankind, can choose to be the cure to the deeper sickness. Only you can choose to nurture the ancient oceans, forests, and grasslands that nurture you to bring back the chorus of birds and monkeys to silent rainforests and to make wise choices every day in what you consume and how you live. By protecting nature in all its wild and wonderful forms, you protect yourselves. As the earth stops to take a collective deep breath, you have a rare opportunity to reimagine and redefine a new future. So tell me, what future do you choose? So um, that was um, pretty powerful and um, interesting, I thought. Let's uh, just reshare here. Um, So this came from uh, Extinction Ends here, and that was the video. Um, and I think a lot of what they were saying was was very pertinent. Um, but if you walk down here to what to do next, um, the first thing that they focused on as a thing to do was to uh, permanently end the commercial trade and sale in markets of terrestrial wild animals for consumption worldwide. So that was what they wanted people to do um despite the breadth of the video so um coming back to my slides that was something that a lot of the big ngos were really focused on doing um during this early time in the pandemic and here's a couple of other um pictures that you can see from um those kinds of campaigns I mean, interestingly, I, I'm not sure that elephants have ever had anything really to do with um, with any um, pandemic disease risk, uh, albeit pangolins and civets perhaps have. So, they, you know, they were eliding this idea of the illegal wildlife trade in big charismatic mammals like um, tigers and elephants with the issue of uh, a zoonotic outbreaks. Um, and as I said, they have this this kind of main uh, aim, which is to permanently end the commercial trade and selling markets of wild terrestrial animals for consumption worldwide. So why does this look on the surface like a good idea? Um, it's a very simple and very clear message that people can rally behind. And if you look at that website, you'll find uh, many people who you will have heard of um, who've signed up as celebrities to do that. It does recognize the link between wildlife trade and zoonotic disease, which we know is there. It sounds like something that could be feasible, and, and they've explicitly said that it wouldn't apply to subsistence users of bushmeat. 
However, I'm going to just talk for the next few minutes about what the reality would actually look like of doing this. How would you actually do this? Would it reduce pandemic risk? And would it actually have the conservation benefit that people are hoping for? Um, of course, we all know that there is zoonotic risk from wildlife. And I've just listed a, an a set of examples of those zoonoses uh, over the years. And um, you can see a lot of them are coming from um, things like fruit bats. Um, some of them are also coming through domestic animals. So Nipah virus and MERS, for example, came through domestic animals from, um, from bats into a domestic animal and then into humans. Um, and I would just like to make a point that um, we're talking about these kind of big ticket ones, but remember that there are also major non-viral zoonoses uh, that often get overlooked that are also important for people's health and wildlife health. And um, there's been some analysis of where zoonotic disease is mostly emerging, and it emerges where there's a kind of overlap between, um, you know, high levels of, of wildlife, wildlife trade and people. Um, although interestingly, you can see a bit of Europe and North America, which is where we've got things like tick-borne diseases coming through. So it's not just these viral ones that, that are mostly emanating from the tropics. And where we get these zoonotic uh, emerging diseases come from, uh, a lot are coming from animals, um, quite a number of them coming from farm animals, but, but the majority are coming from wildlife. But uh, the evidence suggests that the main causes of zoonotic disease emergence is where we're getting a uh, fast change of land use into agriculture, where the wildlife are abutting your agricultural areas. There was quite a nice analysis uh, in 2017 that looked at the relationship between land conversion and human health, looking at some of the key uh, killers of children under five. And you can see here that the main significant increases in illness happen when you have rapid loss of dense forests so that you're right on the frontier of wild areas and where that means then that things like bats that are are losing their it, um their habitats are going into the agricultural areas and directly interacting with livestock and you know reg gave a very nice framing of one health in which we have this uh, relationship between the hazard um the exposure the human vulnerability and putting hazard exposure and human vulnerability gets you risk. And those three things work together. So if we're thinking about it in terms of the wildlife trade, you might say that the hazard is the pathogens that live in wildlife that would normally not uh, transmit into humans. Then you have exposure through people hunting and then taking uh, wild meat into, into markets. The vulnerability comes when you've got poor sanitation or food preparation in markets, for example. And then you have this scaling from the local to the global that causes pandemic uh, due to things like, for example, the illegal wildlife trade, international wild wildlife trade. So that's where the wildlife trade would fit within a, a One Health framing. So now having given a general basic introduction, I'm now just going to delve a little bit deeper into wildlife uh, markets and into what the reality is of uh, consumption of wildlife um, food trade. And so in Africa, uh, wildlife makes up a huge proportion of household economies and of um, the informal um, you know, markets that happen across the continent, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in Central Africa. Um, importantly, they're a source of both protein for people uh, living in rural areas, but also cash where they can sell. Uh, there's very few things that you can sell for ready cash, which might be used then for school fees or medicines or, or ur urgent process, um, urgent um, purchases. And also a major employer of people as a market eco economy. And importantly, uh, a lot of the traders in some of these areas are women. So they're the that women are actually being able to bring money into their households through this trade. Another thing that is really important to note is that uh, the wildlife trade involves a, a wide range of species. So we think about often certain species, but we don't think about the, re the breadth. So it go goes all the way from um, invertebrates through amphibians, through uh, things like cane rats that the boy's holding up, through to um, more protected species uh, like pangolins, colobus monkeys, civets. And I put a diker in the center here um, because in many markets in, in Central Africa, 
Dyker's small antelopes are the vast majority of the, of the animals actually being sold in those markets. So we have to remember that it's a wide range of species. Of course, it includes as well as kind of more sustainable, perhaps ongoing um, consumption of small, fast, 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 fast um, growing, small bodied species. It also includes unsustainable use. And that is particularly when we've got large scale commercial hunting for urban markets. Uh, you can also have uh, hunting of threatened species like great apes, and that could be targeted, but often it's incidental. So they catch themselves in a snare or they're, they're caught when you're out hunting for other things. And so that's a particular danger when snaring is indiscriminate. And a lot of the unsustainability comes when outsiders are coming into the area to make a quick buck from exploiting these resources. I'm just going to give you one of many, many examples of work that's been done that will give you a flavor of what wild meat markets look like in practice. And this is work that was done by my student at the University of Ghana, Hannah Saki. And just as a just as a kind of a cue for you, when it's when when I'm talking about papers that I was involved in, I've put a picture of the first author up of the student who actually led the work. And when there isn't a picture and it's just a reference, then that's work that I wasn't involved in. So this is work that was led by, by Hannah, as I say. So she worked in Northern Ghana where there hasn't been very much work at all on bushmeat and found some incredibly interesting trade dynamics, including massive large scale flows of bushmeat from this savannah area of Northern Ghana, right down to Accra on the coast of the capital to Kumasi, which is a really big city. So, and then lots of local scale trade flows as well, including uh, across the, um, the border um, into, into Burkina Faso. So complicated trade chains, small scale and large scale. What she also found was quite big differences between what you get in the long distance trade chains and what you get in the local trade. So you can see here, this is the percentage of carcasses on sale. At the local scale, there were huge numbers of frogs were on sale and, and uh, not much else really. Um, whereas at the long distance trade, there was a lot of rodents like this big cane rat, um, there were also a lot of ungulates as well, so dikers and things like that um, being sold. So quite different kinds of bushmeat being sold in different uh, to different consumers. You can also see very big differences in price. So we've got fish and beef, which are the kind of standard domestic products being sold there. And you can see, comparatively speaking, that they're, they're relatively cheap. So a lot of the bushmeat is really quite um, favoured including things like guinea fowl, grass cutter um, is, the, is the rats, and then various kinds of bird, hares, things like that. Um, so quite a lot of variation on, on, in the extent to which it's seen as a luxury good or not. And this is mirrored actually in many other places. So this is uh, quite an old slide now from uh, Gabon, where we've got land travel time from Libreville, the capital. So how much um, porcupine, which is a common, well-liked form of bushmeat, is, is being sold for, compared to poultry, which is the most commonly eaten um, domestic meat there. So in Libreville, you can see porcupine is very much a luxury good that is sold to the urban consumer who, who wants to you know, think of traditional value and isn't eating it every day, whereas chicken is the is the day-to-day -day thing. Whereas right out in the rural areas in the middle of the forest, the porcupine is cheap and the poultry is more expensive. So you've got very different types of consumer, very different markets in these different places. So that's just a whistle stop tour of the kinds of things that we that you look at in Africa. In Asia, uh, where there's a huge concern about, about wildlife trade and wild meat consumption, we have to realize that actually that is a very, very diverse market as well. So some of the food, some of it's for food, but it's also used for medicine, for pets, for ornaments. Um, it's sold in the kinds of markets that people were thinking about at the time of of, um, of COVID, you know, uh, wet markets. But it's also sold in traditional shops and also in, in really modern shops as well. Some of this uh, wildlife will be caught and transported from the wild, but a lot of it, large numbers of it, is, is captive bred. Some of it is local. A lot of it is imported from places around the world. So we can't really generalize. Um, just to give you a couple of flavors. Uh, one of my students, Allegri on Meadow, uh, did some work on um, wildlife restaurants in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam and asked people what they'd eaten uh, the last time they were at a, a wild meat restaurant. And you can see here again, a huge variety of different species, some of which are going to have been from Vietnam and some of which are going to be imported. And of concern for us was pangolins. 
um, because these are a highly endangered species group that is um, largely imported nowadays from Africa. So Ale delved a little further in specifically what, what were people um, eating and how commonly were they eating it. And again, with, even within a, diff, a particular species, there's a, a huge variety. So pangolins is, is consumed in three different forms. Um, there's the meat that's sold in restaurants. There's the scales that is used medicinally. Um, and then there's also pangolin wine, which is sometimes uh, e eaten or drunk in restaurants, but is also sold as a tonic. Now, interestingly, um, it can be quite hard to find out um, how much is actually being um, sold and used. So this here is a comparison of what people say when you ask them directly. Um, this is how whether they'd eaten or drunk or any of these things in the last 12 months. So the purple is who's, how many said yes um, if you ask them directly. So you can see very small proportions, like 1% perhaps. And then the orange is how many said yes. If you ask them in an indirect way that allowed them to be anonymous and conceal their answer, and you can see a very different picture where it's really quite a large proportion of people have in the last 12 months had something to do with pangolins. So, um, yeah, kind of interesting. Another example, cigars are my favorite species. Reg mentioned cigars, beautiful thing found in Central Asia. Very, very widely used um, and sold in shops. You can see again, in very tidy shops here, not, not in the kind of wet market form you would imagine, sold as a tonic. So the middle one is, is cooling water, which is just a bit like Gatorade or something. It's also sold in horn strips, which you boil up for fever and also sold as horns itself. Um, so one of my students, Hunter Doughty, she went and looked at who's using cigars and for what in, in Singapore. And interestingly there, we, she did a large survey of, of Chinese Singaporeans and asked them, how how often they used it as their main form of treatment for heatiness. Now, heatiness is like um, feeling a bit fluey, feeling a bit coldy, you know, quite a common uh, way of feeling. 19% of the people who she asked, which was a representative sample of, of Chinese Singaporeans, use saiga horn as their most frequent medicine for heatiness. And this is thinking that, you know, things like paracetamol, neurofen, aspirin, would also be in amongst that. So it's quite alarming that something that's from a critically endangered species um, is being used as the most frequent medication. When asking them why, these are the results. And interestingly, large proportion saying it worked. And we talked even to our colleagues who were researchers working with us in the Chinese Singaporean universities. And they said, well, you know, my grandmother gave it to me when I was sick, uh, when I was a child and I felt better. Um, and we have similar things, you know, in the UK, you know, a paracetamol based thing called cowpaw, you give it to a child, it tastes like strawberries, they feel better. So they had that experience from their childhood. And so the someone recommended it to me often was family members and often it was, um, you know, um, the middle aged women, the grandmothers, the mothers who were the ones who were giving it to them. So um, these kinds of in-depth discussions, these in-depth um, analyses that we have, um, of different products in different places, just say to me that there's a whole lot of complexity in there. And in order to really intervene effectively to reduce consumption of something, you really need to understand it and understand that some of it's illegal also and it's gonna be hard to, to change. Another thing that you really need to understand is that uh, there's a huge potential for unintended consequences. And this is a really classic example, which is uh, not anything to do with me. It's a paper by Bonwit et al about the Ebola outbreak in Guinea in West Africa. And here, um, there was this very strong messaging around public health that was put out by the Ministry of, the, uh, of Health. And you can see here um, the three key messages that they had. And the message two and message three were sensible messages around don't touch um, people uh, who are sick and don't do traditional practices that might expose you to the um, to the to the virus wash your hands and so on but the first one the top one was don't eat bush meat now bonwick did a really good uh, kind of social anthropological approach when she went and looked and asked people how they felt about this and what it did was it made people incredibly distrustful of public health authorities because what they said was well we've been eating bush meat for years and we haven't got sick from ebola and all this is is that conservationists 
are bandwagoning on this uh, public health messaging and trying to get us to stop hunting in the protected areas. And they had a point, actually. It was, it was true that there were protected areas and the conservationists were coming on and really pushing this message of Ebola comes from eating wildlife. And the problem was that people had demonstrable evidence from their own, own eyes that that wasn't the way that it was spread. So of course the first case would have come from wildlife, but at this point in the epidemic, it was being spread by people to people. It was not being spread from eating bushmeat. And so they were very clear that this was an untruth and it, it just made them mistrust the other messages and those other messages are incredibly important. So that was a very dangerous thing to do. So I think this bandwagoning is a really not a helpful thing to do. So during COVID, as we were sitting around trying to get these messages out about, you know, let's think a little bit more nuanced before we start doing wide scale banning um, trade messaging around the world. Um, one of my students, Holly Booth, led us to think about a, a thought experiment. We thought, OK, so let's just say that there was a global ban on the consumption of wild meat. Um, let's say that it happened. What, what would happen then? And so we did a, a large scale analysis using uh, data from the uh, UN FAO, from, from country governments. But then we also brought in colleagues from a range of countries around the world who were deeply embedded in understanding bushmeat. And they gave their nuanced understanding of what would actually happen in their country. So it was a mixture of something that was quite superficial and global and more deep understanding. So let's just explain this graph. So what would if given that wild meat is providing a very large proportion of the protein that people are eating in many countries, what would there are two things that could happen if you removed overnight wild meat from the menu. One thing would be that it would not be replaced and all that protein that people would have had would then not be used, would not be available to them. And so there would be food insecurity. So that's the uh, yellow blob. Another thing that could happen would be, let's say that they continue, they had as much protein as they stayed with the same amount of protein, but it will all then had to be replaced by agriculture. So it all have to be replaced by protein coming from uh, animal agriculture. And that's the blue blob. So we just had a, this is very unrealistic, but we just had a thought experiment about what would happen. And of course, most of what our colleagues from the country's concern said, well, actually, would probably be somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. So there'd be illegal trade or there'd be igno people ignore it. You know, it would be harder to monitor control. But we have these two worst case scenarios of no wild meat replacement or land use change. And then we went through all the countries in the world and, and thought about, OK, which countries under scenario A of um, no replacement, who would be at most risk of food insecurity? So. Um, we found that those were mostly countries, there were eight countries where the per capita protein in, intake would drop below World Health Organization um, standards, and here they are. And that would have knock-on public health risks when we're thinking about One Health. Then on the other side, there are countries at high risk of land use change, and it would be a huge amount of land use change. So uh, more than 23 million football pitches the size of Greece and more than 250 species would be set on a pathway to extinction. And that was a different uh, set of impacts in so Latin America, the USA, Sub-Saharan Africa, with knock-on public health risks of infectious diseases from livestock intensification. So that helps us perhaps to take a step back and think about, all right, so if we have these issues around food insecurity coming through and public health issues from banning, what are the priorities behind NGOs' calls to ban the wildlife markets? And if we understand those priorities, perhaps we can think a bit more clearly about how to address them. So obviously it's, it's expressed, just as it was in Guinea with the Ebola poster, it's expressed as disease risk. We're trying to reduce disease risk. And that's what the messaging was. But actually there are other priorities that people have and they're valid priorities. There are priorities around animal welfare. We don't want to see animals suffering in these markets. And, you know, terrible things happen where animals are highly stressed and put together in these markets. Uh, big welfare issues, but also disease risk issues, because we know that transmission between species is likely to happen when they're highly stressed and crammed together in unsanitary conditions in markets. So there is an overlap there. There's also the conservation issue. So if you have endangered species that are coming into markets, 
um, again, you have an overlap with the welfare and the disease risk, but there are genuine conservation issues when you're eating uh, wildlife that is threatened. And then the final one is a livelihoods priority, which perhaps is not shared so much by the big NGOs, but, but you know, they still talk about subsistence users. So there's an issue around all the people who are making money and also relying on food for their food security. So that's important too, and that overlaps as well. So then you could think about, all right, so let's think about a few actual species and see where they sit on this Venn diagram. So gorillas, for example, I've colored red the circles where this is a big issue and I've colored blue the circles where it's a bit ambivalent and you'll see some greens later where we don't, I don't really think it's a problem. So red, bad, blue, hmm, and green, uh, probably okay. So in the case of a gorilla, or other great apes, you know, there are high, high issues of animal welfare. It's a highly endangered species. There are disease risks because it shares risk, serious diseases with humans. And these great apes are not a major source of food or livelihood. They tend to be opportunistic or cursory hunted. So in this case, we don't actually need to do anything different though, because great apes pretty much universally are already illegal to hunt. So what we actually need to do is not put new bans in, we just need to enforce the existing legislation. Okay, so that's something that could be done. Let's think about bats. So bats are, are a serious disease risk. They're a reservoir for many zoonotic diseases. You saw in that list I put up earlier, bats were implicated a lot. So sales in markets would be risky. However, um, the animal welfare will be quite ambivalent because sometimes they can they're, they're killed quite quickly on site um, they're not brought to market necessarily. The analyses for conservation, it's quite uncertain and quite variable. Meat consumption may not be the worst threat that bats are facing. Um, livelihoods, it's also ambivalent. Hun hunting may be for food or livelihood, but it's not one of these major traded taxons that would support a lot of livelihoods. So in the case of bats, I think we have a, a recommendation to actually ban the trade, and that would be clearly for public health reasons. Let's think about frogs. I showed you in Ghana that lots of frogs, but they're also very widely used in Asia as well. So in terms of animal welfare, they could in principle, maybe they're not be kept relatively humanely in captive breeding, for example, there's no known zoonotic issues. Captive bred frog trade is a livelihood for many. In, in China, there's a, it's, there's a huge captive bred trade in, uh, in frogs, which it has a very large uh, impact on, on, on the economy. And in conservation terms, uh, these bullfrogs are not necessarily threatened. The one issue would be disease risk to wild amphibians. Um, but in, in some senses, it might be positive because you might divert people away from hunting them if you captive breed them. So in this sense, it might be strongly regulated farm trade only and that, that, that farming and the regulation would be for conservation reasons rather than for the other reasons. Last one, dikers. I told you dikers are very wide, a large proportion of the, the trade in Africa. So here we've got some issues with animal welfare potentially because they're snared, but the harvest is apparently sustainable for most of these small species. There's no known zoonotic issues, and they're an important source of livelihoods and protein for people. So in this case, maybe sustainable trade would be important. So you can see you could do a risk-based approach with different species having different risks. Okay, so now I'm going to start stepping out. And the first thing I'm going to do is step out into... Um, COVID-19 did more than just um, cause, you know, it was, was more than just a disease. It was also something that massively impacted economic systems. And so led by James McNamara, we did an analysis of how it might change the wild meat trade in sub-Saharan Africa. It was a thought experiment in which we thought about all the different pathways, and I'm not going to go through it, by which um, at the global, national and local um, levels, COVID might have changed things in these complicated supply chains. So, you know, awareness of zoonotic disease risk, the fact that there were disrupted markets for all sorts of commodities that were nothing to do with wild meat. There was less use of global transport and there was less international travel, which would lead to less tourism, but also lots of changes in food prices in urban areas and rural areas, uh, falls in income, people going home to their rural areas, people maybe being concerned about meat and so reducing its demand and and feeding through that would either increase or decrease the amount of hunting that was done so we produced this framework 
And then with our colleagues in two countries, Ghana and Gabon, we, we did a thought experiment through from their expert knowledge of what happens in their countries, what would be the most likely pathways? So in Ghana, for example, where there isn't that heavy a reliance on bushmeat for livelihoods, but a lot of reliance on commodities like coffee and cocoa for their main uh, national income, we felt that the disruption of export markets leading to falls in urban employment and disposal of incomes would tend to reduce urban demand, and so less commercial hunting, but would increase rural demand because people would have would be going home and then eating food uh, locally. In Gabon, on the other hand, uh, they have a much larger bushmeat market. Um, they're also very much dependent on the oil market because that's one of their big uh, exports. And so the decline in global transport use would lead to big falls in income, big falls in disposable income and likely increases in hunters. After we did that fourth experiment, another group of people have just published um, a comparator that kind of uses our framework and looks at what actually happened in three different places. And I can't go into great detail, but interestingly, some of what we suggested was borne out and some of it wasn't. So a lot of subsistence hunting, uh, less commercial hunting, not that much wild meat health concern generally across these places. Um, um, and a lot of issues with closing of retailers and causing quite a lot of economic harm to people. So to summarize this bit, um, calls to brand the commercial trade in wildlife are superficially attractive. There's much underlying complexity so that it's not likely to have a desired effect. Having a risk-based approach might be more appropriate. And we need more understanding of the drivers of the wildlife trade, both individual for people and systemic to support interventions. And COVID altered these drivers in complex ways. So to focus even further out to the many challenges that we are facing. So you're all probably aware of um, planetary boundaries and the fact that we have this donut economics where we're thinking about all the planetary boundaries that we are breaching in terms of the ecological uh, ceiling, but also that there are shortfalls in our social foundation. So, so the red inside is where we're not meeting the sustainable development goals and the outside is, the, is um, biodiversity and so on. And this is um, highlighted by things like the fact that now we have only 4% of our mammal biomass is wild mammals and that we've got massive increases in global terrestrial wild vertebrate, decreases in wild vertebrate numbers. If you focus in, then you can see land use change, mostly for agriculture, is the huge driver in many of these places, along with other things. Climate change is just starting to become an issue. So we have this triple challenge, which I, I like this framing very much that we've got to try and feed 9 billion people, keep climate change below 1.5 degrees and halt and reverse the loss of biodiversity. So what should we as researchers do in the face of this triple challenge? We should be providing evidence about what works and what doesn't and allow people then to focus on the key issues. And I think the problem with COVID and wildlife trade is that it wasn't the key issue that we needed to focus on. And um, so we need to engage widely to make sure that people do focus on the right issues and give people the information they need. Maybe we need also to act more directly. But what frustrated me about COVID and the wildlife trade and why I spent a lot of my time during that time going out and talking about the truth about wildlife trade is that what mostly happened, and you can see the data on this, was a lot of distraction, talk, eliding trophy hunting with, wild, wild, with bushmeat consumption. And, you know, you'll be aware from what I've just been saying, trophy hunting has nothing to do with wild meat consumption and wildlife trade as, as commonly um, highlighted. And that led to celebrities coming out and really supporting um, the banning of trophy hunting in order to fulfill public health needs and that and then push back from local Africans and greater terrible abuse as well. So this is my colleague, Amy Dickman, who um, has had huge abuse for trying to present the evidence uh, around this. The other thing that we do is we wag our fingers at people and this is a particularly interesting one. This world scientist warning to humanity, a second notice. So this was this is a, a follow-up from one that was done 25 years ago. And these scientists um, in 2017 said, we, we told you people 25 years ago to mend your ways and you didn't mend your ways. And now we're going to tell you again. And it's like kind of, no, Nanny says that this is not the right thing to do. And the problem is that they're just not cutting through. 
And so these kinds of figure wagging does not cut through. It may lead to short term anger. It may lead to short term um, protest. But in the long run, people do not respond well to that kind of approach. Scary messaging, negative messaging doesn't cut through. Instead, and this is one of my students' work again, what we need to do is try to think about long-term solutions. So instead of getting people aware and then panicked so they avoid, or aware and then disengaged or finding simplistic solutions like banning, we need them to, to kind of join a community and avoid their burnout and then be able to engage in the long-term. And when I say long-term, I mean long-term. So I really like this slide. I'm aware of the time, by the way, I'm going to finish very quickly. Um, I'm a, I, I like this slide because it tells you how you have to be in things for the long term. So these are various kinds of socially liberal uh, legislation in the USA. And the, the gray line you can see is the number of states with legislation. So at the point at which the, the dot happens, that means all the states adopted the appropriate legislation. And what, what this shows you is about societal tipping points. That, that you rumble along and you rumble along with, with very little change for years and years and years and years and years. And then you get this tipping point where society suddenly thinks, okay, well, this is something that we can sign up to. And then suddenly um, things take off and become part of societal norms. So how are we gonna get to that with biodiversity and nature loss? Well, I think with this scare tactic thing, you know, and the potential for disengagement, that is not the way we go. We need to try to engender some kind of positivity amongst people that they can make a difference. And there's huge numbers of ways of doing it. I've just put up here our conservation optimism um, initiative, which is trying to stop burnout in conservationists, but also give um, the members of the public hope that things can change and they are changing. And then people can then, as members of the public, feel themselves to be conservationists. These are random members of my family who were made to do this. But the point we're making is, you know, you should be, as a solicitor or an engineer or a teacher or an artist, you should all be feeling like you are contributing and you're able to contribute. Um, so that you then get the social movements that start with, for example, one little girl sitting in Sweden and goes to a social movement um, where people do feel empowered. So, in climate change, we have our 1.5 to stay alive. That's our kind of global goal. That's where we're all aiming for. In um, nature, we now have the same thing. We have the global biodiversity framework where we have a mission for 2030 to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. We have things like the World Economic Forum giving assessments of dependence on biodiversity so that business community really care now. And they, they're putting big numbers on the value of biodiversity they're seeing climate change and also biodiversity loss as key risks over many years. So this is the fourth or fifth year in which biodiversity has come up as one of the very high risks that businesses feel are important. So final word, wildlife trade is multifaceted, multifaceted, mostly unconnected to disease risk. We can't ignore the realities of livelihoods. We need a risk-based approach. We need to move away from scapegoating an opportunistic bandwagon when we link biodiversity conservation with public health. We shouldn't be superficial and stereotyped. We need to be clear about our motivations and we need to think through our consequences of our interventions, just like in Guinea. We need to focus on other factors like agriculture, poverty, urban markets, habitat destruction. We can't just focus on wild meat consumption and expect to get systemic change. And when we're thinking about systemic change, we need to learn from the COVID induced systemic changes that we've already seen. And people are starting to do that. There's been a bundle of lessons, learnt uh, reports um, that have come out since COVID. I don't see that much action yet on actually learning those lessons, but let's hope. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, EJ, this was great. Now folks, if, if you have some questions that I can see that one has come in, uh, please do put them into the Q&A. So uh, EJ, Sarah asks, do you think allowing hunting of a managed population of wild animals or farming livestock would be more overall sustainable? Well, Redu substantially reducing our consumption of animal meat 
is the most effective way to increase sustainability. So not necessarily saying no animal meat, but um, all the evidence suggests that if you reduce the amount of farmed livestock that you eat, um, that is one of your best contributions to sustainability. Um, so having said that, for the animal protein that I get, is, I guess is left 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 over. I mean, I would say um, a mixture. So some livestock is more effective, more more intensive, uh, easier to uh, to do in an effective way than others. So chicken, for example, pork as well, um, is relatively possible to make sustainable. You can also have very small amounts of, of, of sustainable beef, of course. I think managing populations of wildlife is both potentially sustainable, but also, um, you know, can provide a reason for rural populations to value their land. So I think, you know, it's really important that we as human beings don't separate ourselves too much from the land, that we actually understand that that is where our food comes from. So, for example, in the UK, we've got massive overpopulation of deer i don't know if you have to but um oh, yes <laughs> yeah. the, the more people shoot and eat deer the better basically in the uk we don't have any wolves anymore you know we, we've got just we can't have forests because the deer eat it all so you know there are certain species that are really very clearly need it would be beneficial for all concerned except the deer possibly or actually probably even for the deer not the individual anyway i've witted on that that's enough yeah we have another question from Phoebe. She's uh, one of our, our favorite listeners. She's with us for nearly every seminar. Phoebe asks, are wild animals taken only for certain reasons, e.g. horns, musk organs, skins, but the meat not eaten, thus animals not used? It varies. Um, so I think a lot of the wildlife trades that we see, for example, the pangolin example I gave, every single bit of those pangolins is used. Um, and um, yeah, whether that makes it more sustainable or not, I doubt it. But um, there are certain things where you do just get, obviously shark finning was the um, was the example of when there's huge waste. Um, I would say that in most cases when we've got the things like bushmeat trade in Africa and red, you know, you, you know, as well as I do, it's very fully used. Yeah. I think I've, I've really enjoyed your presentation because I think one of the key items that I think was missing when I started working with bushmeat was understanding that there is no typical, that, you know, you, you can be looking at what's going on in a rural area and look at what's going on in a city area. Those are going to be very different. And it depends on access to other protein sources or the value in the market for that particular item. And it, it seemed to me that every time I would enter the country, it would be different, you know, and that, that something had changed. And you've been talking about pangolins in, in the time that I was working in Liberia, uh, pangolins were a food item and Nobody really talked about utilizing the scales for much of anything in Liberia, but we were supporting a student in this last year or two and considerable amount of trade in scales now going into Ghana. It's uh, really sad, actually. Yeah. So in Nigeria, where we worked as well, you know, people were using them for food and not, you know, it wasn't a problem for years. And then suddenly traders come in and start asking yeah. for scales. And suddenly, you know, these are hugely valuable. Shall I answer Ben's question? I can just. Yeah, I was going to say we've got another question here. Yeah. So Ben is asking, good afternoon and happy One Health Week. When you conducted your thought experiments and other studies, did you rely on experts from other fields to contribute their knowledge on economics and culture? Or did you and your student colleagues Take these perspectives into account yourselves. On that note, would you promote collaboration with people of particular specialties, linking silos together, or individuals taking up a broad range of fields to be well-rounded, eliminating those silos? Ben, I love you. Okay. It's, it's a brilliant question. <laughs> and um, I'll start with the second more general question. Um, I... I think both. I mean, there's nothing I love more than having a discussion with an economist or an anthropologist or a public health person. You know, that's what makes academic 
collaboration interesting if you've got people from different specialities different perspectives and having a, an argument and a discussion with them is just so invigorating so i would say definitely collaborating with people uh, linking silos together but i also think that it's useful to be well-rounded and to eliminate silos where you can and so i do think that it's worth you know so um some people are really suited to interdisciplinarity and some aren't you know and that's fine too you know that you don't have to be interdisciplinary but you can be in your discipline and talk to people from other disciplines or you yourself can have a range of disciplines and specialize in being interdisciplinary there's a really good paper that was written by some early career researchers um which uh they um they included uh various of us um i'll send it to reg afterwards okay and he can circulate it which is top tips 10 top tips for being interdisciplinary so that's that's a very oh, helpful one because it that'd asks be some, great. It asks yeah. some of those questions um in terms of uh those particular thought experiments so uh our, the people from the countries were co-authors and they were generally interdisciplinary conservation scientists like us so we didn't have time to because we were trying to bring it out in a way that would actually influence debate so we we worked with our colleagues who were people like us but based in the national universities in their countries who will bushmeat specialists so we didn't go very very broad which is why i'm quite excited uh for the kind of systemic change paper where people are now validating it or not and testing it and um yeah so we try to make sure that everything was grounded but it was it was a thought experiment and it was a quick one great well, I've got to say, too, your your talk about messaging uh, fits in well. Uh, Delval just has initiated a One Health minor in, uh, in One Health Communications. And I think that the communications component is so important. And I've got to admit, I am very guilty of the doom and gloom component of things. I've been devastated myself by seeing numbers. Uh, and I probably pass that on more than I do the optimism that we should have. Uh, so I'm really glad to to hear about, uh, you know, getting people to think more from a, a positive point of view and actions that can be taken and all of us becoming conservationists, which is basically what we're hoping with One Health across Del Val's majors is to make everybody realize that our future is tied to the future of, of everything else on the planet. Definitely. And I think, um, you know, it's hard for everybody to to not have the gloomy days when things are so difficult in the world. And particularly when you're seeing signs of climate change everywhere. But, you know, I think it's really, really important to raise your head up and think about there are ways forward. And even the fact that people are talking about biodiversity is a win now. You know, because five years ago, people weren't talking about biodiversity at all in the public discourse in, you know, we, uh, businesses would never have been talking about it. And so we are on the way. It's slow. It's much, much, much slower than it should be. But we're on the way. And uh, yeah, I started conservation optimism mostly because I felt a sense of responsibility to all my students who go out into the world and uh, are burning out and trying to do their best and finding that it's very, very hard to to see the light and we all have to try and see the light sometimes yeah um, so it's not a everything's fine in the world it's a we recognize things but we have to hold together um in terms of bobby's question which i've read about ethnic uh groups i think absolutely we should help people to keep on with their culture and that you know again it comes back to what are your being really really clear about your priorities so if your priority is about public health and disease then you know, there are many ways that you can address that through hygiene, sanitation, um, maybe not trading every species. I, I don't think bats should be in markets. I don't think there's a place for bats in markets, but other species, less of a problem. And for animal welfare, you can do it. And for culture, you can do it. So just be really clear about your priorities and making sure that um, you're honoring, you know, the cultural and well-being elements, which I often feel get left behind. Well, I think Claire actually wraps things up quite nicely with saying thank you so much for your thoughtful and holistic view of things. I think it helps to pull a lot of issues together for, for us and uh, for us to maybe kind of 
reinvigorate a more positive point of view and looking toward those solutions. Well, thank you for the invite and thank you all for your questions. Really, really good and interesting questions. Thank you so much, EJ, and I hope you have a good evening. Uh, we've We've still got a few activities this afternoon. <laughs> Excellent. Enjoy. Nice to meet you all. Oh, by the way, I should say, if anybody wants to talk, you know, please feel free to email me. I'm quite happy to um, to receive emails if anybody would like. Um, Excellent. Excellent. And EJ, if you'll send me those, those references you were talking about, I will make those available to folks as well. Although, is this a final question here? Oh, just, no, just to thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great Bye. evening, EJ. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.